the whole trick and the secret is of creating a film uh, by literally saying you're doing it. I mean, it's not a matter of asking someone to let you make a movie. Francis is the smartest of all the filmmakers in terms of trying to bring filmmakers together and do interesting things and move into technology and move the rest of the world into technology. But the idea is you got to really, if you, if you've got to really want to do something and then nothing can stop you, I believe. I thought that he was just, you know, another, you know, sort of mistake in the security of Hollywood, you know. I looked at the whole thing as sort of a walled city and there were breaches in the defenses. Occasionally you could get in through one of these breaches and, 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 you know, see what was on the other side of the wall. That didn't mean that the police wouldn't find you sooner or later. On the rain people, uh, Warner Brothers didn't want me to make them. I mean, they couldn't, they couldn't care less about this movie. I merely went into them one day and I said, it's Friday, Tuesday, we're flying to New York and we're going to shoot some movie, uh, some film for my new movie. They said, what's it about? What's the story? You know, we got to approve it. I said, well, if you don't want to make it, I'll pay for it myself. When I made Easy Rider, he was coming across uh, the top. He, we were, go I was going across the south of the country and he was going across the north. He was doing uh, The Rain People. Francis Ford Coppola is the writer-director on the crest of the new wave of American filmmakers. Already he has been named Best Director and the Rain People awarded the grand prize at the San Sebastian Festival in Spain. He'd gotten on the wall somehow and he'd gotten, you know, the, the local authorities convinced that he should be there. And of course he brought in the Trojan horse. <laughs> Would you tell something about your young assistant, George Lucas? Oh, he's not my assistant, actually. Yeah. Could you tell us about your young associate? <laughs> associate, okay. Um, George uh, won an award to come to Warner Brothers and observe a film being made there, and he came when we were making Finian's Rainbow, and one day I, I was I was working on the show, and I kept seeing a skinny kid with a beard, and he's always looking. <laughs> went up to him, I said, well, you know, I said, who's that? And he said, well, he's observing you. I think the, the student films are the, are the only real hope. I think they're slowly beginning to realize that students know what they're doing. There was an issue of Time magazine, and it had pictures of all of us in there, and we just won the National Student Film Festival. I won it for Marcello I'm so bored. George won it for THX. Um, Marty Scorsese won for one of his films, or he, his probably was a real film. Mike Medavoy was a young talent agent, barely out of the mailroom, when he went looking for the next big thing. So I called my secretary and said, hey, find these guys, let's, let's call them. So I went up and I called um, John Milius, I went out and signed him, uh, signed Spielberg, signed a few others. He was a very, very good agent, was he was a terrible deal maker. He, he'd, you know, he'd, he'd get you anything. You know, if the guy, you know, had said, well, I really can't, I, I want to hire the guy, but I, I've only got $35. Metavoy would take the $35. But what was good about that was it kept you working. As the oldest of the film school grads, Francis Coppola set up Zoetrope as a production banner for emerging talent. Two of the new generation of film men, Francis Coppola and George Lucas, are discussing director Lucas' new movie, THX 1138. George, where did the very first idea of sex come to you? It uh, actually came from reading comic books when I was about 10 years old. Well, Zotrope was the first attempt by a kind of outsider filmmaker who was going to bring together and form a commune of filmmakers. And it's to Francis's credit that he tried to put it together. Everybody had like a six-picture deal with Francis. So it was about six other filmmakers, my husband among them, whose projects were supposed to go at Warner's. The deal was we were driving to Warner Brothers. Francis would show them THX, which was American Zoetrope's flagship first production. And then they would be presented with these silver boxes with our scripts. They saw THX, everyone's project was canceled. Lucas was angry and humiliated by Warner Brothers' reaction to the film and the studio's cancellation of the other Zoetrope projects. A crushed Francis Coppola withdrew to San Francisco taking a high-paying script job on the film Patton. Just the whole thing was that Francis was kind of regarded as this guy who'd sold them out. Francis was the establishment now. While Francis Coppola was trying to explain to Lucas, Hike, and the others why he couldn't save their projects, 
Peter Bogdanovich was trying to get his next directing job. Bert Schneider uh, was looking for new films to do after Easy Rider's success. And he had made a deal with me to let me direct my first movie, A Safe Place, which Jack Nicholson agreed to be in. Uh, and Jack Nicholson uh, was given the, the permission to direct his first film, Drive, he said. And along the way, I thought of Peter. They said to me, well, if you ever have a picture you want to make, we'd be interested in making a picture with you. So not too long after that, I, um, I, I, I called and said, there's a book I'd like to do called The Last Picture Show. It's, uh, it's, a, it's You can get it in paperback. Larry McMurtry read, wrote it. Bert said, well, send it on over. I said, why don't you buy it? Arrogant, thinking, well, if he can't even buy the book, then he's not going to be interested in making it. He, so about a week later, he called me and said, well, it took me a while to find the goddamn book, but we got it, and we'd like to make it. So we made the movie. It was full of lots of drama. The Last Picture Show was a frank, almost European exploration of sexuality in a classic American filmmaking style. It was also an emotionally painful experience for its makers, the husband and wife team of director Peter Bogdanovich and production designer Polly Platt. We were in pre-production in LA and we were already looking at actors and actresses to play these parts and I saw a magazine cover at this check stand of Ralph's Market and there was this girl with what I thought looked like a sexual chip on her shoulder, corkscrew curls, you know, blonde hair, blue eyes, just arrogant little thing, you know, although she turns out to be a tall, tall girl. And I said to Peter, doesn't that look like JC? It's just the way JC should look. And Peter said, yes. And, you know, he said about finding her. I just can't describe it in words. I had an affair with Jeff Bridges very briefly, and then he went away for a um, National Guard duty reserve, and that was that was when Peter made that uh, fateful comment to me. We were shooting the scene in the theater, my first scene in the movie, and um, he was sitting in the row behind me, leaned forward and said, I don't know who I want more, you or J.C. And I, I was so struck by that, and they said, we're ready, Sybil. And I had to get up and, and go and make that entrance where I come in and say, what y'all doing back here in the dark? And, I mean, it lit that moment. It lit that moment. It was real. Peter meant it, but it was also, <laughs> it was, you couldn't have told, uh, well, me, certainly at that time, anything else that would have, I was, I was lit up. Her boyfriend back in New York didn't want her to show her breasts or do any of the nude scenes in the movie. And so there were all these tears and, you know, drama. And I remember, you know, I saw my husband falling in love with her or falling in, you know, developing this crush on her. And I remember being grateful that she even had a boyfriend, you know. And Peter asked me, it was very interesting, he said, do you think I should fire her? Because uh, she, she won't do these nude scenes. And uh, I said, no. I don't think anything could have stopped it. I feel very badly uh, in many ways now that I'm a little wiser for Polly. I know that must have been hell for her. I even, you know, in a certain way, I, I understood, I felt it was an occupational hazard of the job. I just thought it might be a temporary thing. I've learned since over many years that I was far more like J.C. than I ever imagined in real life. If I had it to do all over again, I would do the same. While Bogdanovich's marriage was coming apart, Warren Beatty was winning a reputation as Hollywood's premier bachelor. However, his follow-up to Bonnie and Clyde, the only game in town, wasn't scoring nearly as well. Beatty needed a hit, and he believed strongly in directors. John McCabe. He came with poetry on his lips. Frog had wings, he wouldn't bump his ass so much. A deck in his pocket. What do you say we make this a uh, nickel game, huh? Let's start off with. A man who knew where he was going. Where are you going? Nowhere. Uh, I, I was uh, just wondering where you was going to go. 
Well, uh, I was gonna go over there by that fence. The only problem was the director of his next film, Robert Altman, believed the only star on an Altman film was Robert Altman. And Beatty, after successfully producing Bonnie and Clyde, was not prepared to play a supporting role even to his director. Warren kept worrying about coverage because he had produced Bonnie and Clyde and he, you know, by that time he had a sense of, of what you needed to cut away to and Bob doesn't direct that way. So the times when, when things got testy, was, it was really a matter of style. Warren is very precise and you have to honor that but he was, he's not the director or making the film at that moment in time. There was a scene actually going on about eight minutes. It's a wonderful scene. We shot with two cameras. So two cameras, eight minutes long, and we did it about 40 times. I imagine just, uh, just how many rolls of film that was. Was that 80 rolls of film? Because we had to use 80 rolls of film. That's 80,000 feet of film. So we went probably about, I don't know, 37 or 38, when uh, Robert said, I said, well, you know, I, it's not getting better. I told you that take eight was perfect for me and all that. You kept going and all that, you know, it's, I am happy with take eight. And uh, and Warren says, I want to do one more. And then Robert said, okay, Warren, I tell you what, I'm tired, I'm going to home. You do as many takes as you want to. These boys are going to take it, you know, for you just finish it when you want. And then he went home. Neither Beatty or Altman came away happy. And McCabe would mark the last time that a star would destabilize one of Altman's productions. Over at Paramount, studio heads Robert Evans and Peter Bart were about to find themselves homeless. Well, what happened was that the, um, the uh, I mean, reduced to simplest terms, the mafia bought the lot with the Vatican Bank as a front arranged by a rather unsavory character named Michele Lessendona. I say to you, he was a bit unsavory, I meaning he ended up being murdered in a jail in Sicily, which I would suggest is a reasonable qualification for unsavory. But at this moment in time, he was a, a banker. He bought the lot, immediately started shooting porn movies on a lot. Evans and Bart moved Paramount's offices to Beverly Hills. While all this was going on, Mario Puzo approached his friend Bob Evans desperately in need of cash for gambling debts. Evans wrote a check on the spot for 10 grand for an outline Puzo gave him about the mafia. The book was published, and this obscure project that I was nursing along that no one paid any attention to was the number one bestseller in the world. Suddenly everybody in the studio and in the parent company and had a better idea as to who should direct it and who should star in it. And we talked to everybody. Evans and I talked to almost everybody. Nobody wanted to do it. It glorified the mafia. It made them, don it made them Robin Hoods and all the excuses you can think of. All of a sudden, everybody got off the picture. The picture couldn't be put together. And suddenly it turned up on my desk again as an almost abandoned project. <laughs> so went back to plan A. I got a call from uh, Peter asking me if I'm interested in producing The Godfather. I couldn't catch my breath for a minute. And of course I said, oh, beyond the shadow of a doubt. He said, well, the one caveat is Charlie Bluton wants to meet. He has to approve the producer and the director of The Godfather. Can you come to New York and meet Mr. Bluton? And I said, absolutely. So I come to his office, Jan Stanley's office. The adjoining door flies open. It's Charlie Bluto and this hyper wacko Austrian. Buddy, I'm Charlie Bluto. And I, <laughs> now, that was the last line. Doesn't ask me how was the flight, nothing. He said, What do you mind to do with this movie? I looked at him, I looked at my book. If I said, If I start discussing this book, it's the end of the meeting. I said, Charlie. I want to make an ice blue, terrifying movie about people you love. That's brilliant. He jumps, he runs out of the office, slams the door. Yes, Stanley, what the hell is that? He said, I'll find out. Goes in the other room. He says, Charlie thinks you're a genius, you got the job. Hollywood was stunned when Paramount announced that their blockbuster bestseller was to be directed by Francis who? Francis had 
as a director, done You're a Big Boy Now, Finian's Rainbow, The Rain People, so it's hardly the greatest recommendation for taking him over to direct. So truthfully, we hired Francis as a result of his writing ability. He had already won the Academy Award, just won it for Pat. Coppola had initially turned Paramount's offer down. He didn't want to do a Hollywood gangster movie. Anyone who remembers the original Godfather book, it had a lot of sleazy aspects to it that, of course, were cut out for the movie. And I didn't like it very much for those reasons. And I, did, and I was very frightened of getting, once again, co-opted into another project like uh, Low Budget. It was a very inexpensive film. And in those days, they wanted young directors because they wanted it cheap. Uh, and I did turn it down, actually, once or twice. You know, the Zoetrope studio was, wasn't working. And um, I admired his idealism, but he did have some kids. And, and um, I reminded him rather frequently that he was broke and that this would be one way of getting out of it. And uh, he, he kind of agreed. <laughs> While The Godfather preoccupied the higher-ups at Paramount, Bart and Evans gave the go-ahead to a bizarre little script helmed by a director considered extremely eccentric, even by the standards of 60s Hollywood. The prototypical early 70s meeting, Hal Ashby, who couldn't pitch anything, you know, long, scruffy beard, uh, the ultimate film geek. For a guy who, when you first met him, looked like he would never be able to tie his own shoes and that you worried about if he was going to cross the street, who really would have surprised you if he'd ever later in life figured out how to work an ATM machine. But if you look behind that, but here's a man who manipulated the studios to do exactly as, as he wanted. He comes in, he says, I'd like to introduce you to somebody who got a sense of this movie. He brings in Cat Stevens. Well, you know, Cat Stevens is not somebody you would even want to be in the same room with. He looked like a homeless person. And the two of them in their you know, articulate 60s way start pitching Harold and Mort. And they had a great sense of the movie. But you know, Bob and I had spent a few months trying to persuade Hal to do it, not, to, not till he met Cat, and they came up with this idea for sort of like a mini opera. Did this thing make sense? We were this kind of little unit that was out of sight, out of mind, so to speak. And they'd look at dailies. And, I mean, Hal had a, uh, his philosophy was, here's a script, you've hired me as a director, I'm going to cast it, we've agreed on a budget, beat it. So midway through the cutting period, we had half the film that he sent off to Paramount, and they loved him. I mean, and they thought, they really, they thought. And thus so that we had a Christmas release. Organic. The first review was uh, Murph in Variety, and it said, uh, Harold Ahmad is as funny as a burning orphanage. And, I, and, and that was a good one. I mean, Time said, we're going to do you a favor, we're not going to review it. So, um, uh, so that was the end of it. I mean, it opened and closed in a week, and it was gone. Bingo. I mean, it was so weird. <laughs> and we spent a year on it, you know? And, uh, and, and nobody got it. In the weeks before Christmas, 1971, Paramount Pictures began a nationwide campaign advertising The Godfather. They were doing something no studio had ever done, opening a film everywhere at once on an unprecedented 400 screens. The picture opened to phenomenal business, grossing over $80 million in its initial run. Nothing in Hollywood history had ever made this much money this fast. They saw the amount of money that came through the door. And suddenly, Gulf, every, hey, News Corp, everyone started looking at studios differently. They started looking at studios as real cash cows. The success of The Godfather confirmed Francis Coppola as a genuine artist. He would use that power to help other directors, but first, he would bring the exiled George Lucas back to Hollywood. And ultimately, what got graffiti made was they said, if Francis Coppola produces this film, you know, we'll, we'll do it. 
George kept saying, is I know uh, people are going to love this movie. You know, I know it will be a big hit. And we kept saying, George, if you make this movie, <laughs> consider yourself very fortunate. Yeah, you just might make it as a Pharaoh, yeah, boy. Everyone in that set believed and said and stated aloud that this was a classic film, that we were making a classic, a cult movie, a movie that would be important. And I said, what are you talking about? This is just a little movie. It's just a little thing. It's, it's, we're here in Modesto. What are we, you know, we're not making history here. I'll never forget the, the horror at which the people at Universal, when they looked at this picture, what is this? This is not even good enough to run on television. I mean, what is this thing? Someone said, well, the kids may like it. They said, the kids, but they don't go to the movies. <laughs> the whole orientation was different. And there was a famous incident where they, you know, where Francis said, if you don't like this movie and don't want to do anything with it, I do. I think it's great, and here's a check, and, and I'll buy it. We had made an offer. There were discussions, and at the last moment, Universal smartly decided to preview it before uh, an audience and deliberately invite some kids. And of course, I knew the jig was up, you know, because the kids adored this movie. And the people at Universal said, we thought of selling this? We don't want to sell this movie. But uh, there was no understanding about the youth market. That was later. With the success of American Graffiti, the door swung open to Hollywood's next generation, which was coming ashore in Malibu.